Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving a nice trigonometric equation. We could also call it a radical trigonometric equation because we have the square root of sine x and the opposite of that, which equals cosine x. And we're going to try to solve for x values. Can we find an exact solution for this? We're going to check. We're also going to check our answers with our graph. All right, so first of all, when you have an equation like this, it's kind of non-standard, right? Not necessarily super non-standard, but it's probably not one of those exercises you will see in a typical textbook, especially because of the radicals. Anyway, so we have cosine x equals negative square root of sine x, and this tells us a couple of things. First of all, if we're looking for real solutions, which we are, because I have another channel called A plus PI, which is all about complex numbers. You can go ahead and check them out later after this video, maybe. But this channel basically focuses on trigonometry, number theory, and algebra. Sometimes a little bit of geometry, hopefully sometime soon. So we're going to go ahead and focus on real solutions then. I mean, we can also talk about complex solutions, but um, if we have some time left towards the end, okay? But this equation tells us a couple of things. For, for example, because we are square rooting sine x, sine x cannot be negative. What does that mean? It means sine x needs to be greater than or equal to zero. But here's the middle and the other question. Can sine x be zero? And the answer is no. Why? Because if sine x is zero, that implies that cosine x is zero, but sine and cosine cannot be zero at the same time because we have the famous Pythagorean identity that says sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals one. So they can't be zero at the same time. One of them can be zero, the other one can be one or negative one or vice versa, but not zero at the same time. Makes sense? So we could safely say that sine x must be greater than zero. I mean, that's a stronger inequality. You don't have to go by that, but it's uh, kind of like more strict. And then this also implies because a sine needs to be greater than zero, square root of sine x will also be greater than zero. Its opposite will be less than zero. So this implies cosine x needs to be less than zero. So when we solve the problem, we have to make sure that sine x is positive, cosine x is negative. And guess what? We're going to talk about what it means when we get to the solution, because that's going to make more sense. But under these conditions, let's go ahead and try to solve this equation. How do you solve a radical equation? What is the first thing you do? If you said square both sides, you got it. So we're going to go ahead and square both sides here, making sure that the minus sign is inside the parentheses so that when we square negative one, we get positive one. So the negative disappears. This is good and bad. It's good because we get rid of the radical, but at the same time, we have to be careful because we introduce or we might introduce extraneous solutions. Solutions that are not solutions to the original equation. Okay, so you gotta be very careful. And let's go ahead and square both sides, cosine squared x. And on the right hand side, this is gonna be just sine x. The negative disappears as a result of squaring the negative one. Make sense? Wow, this is cool, but we're going to make it cooler. How do we make it cooler? You need the same kind of things. In other words, you don't want cosine and sine mixed in an equation unless it's very, very special and easy to solve. You kind of want one kind. And you can do that by using the Pythagorean identity we just talked about. You see the connection? I can go ahead and replace cosine squared with 1 minus sine squared. You get that? Because if you isolate cosine squared from here, you get one minus sine squared. And of course, the same thing goes for sine squared, but in this case, we would like to use cosine squared. So replace cosine squared with one minus sine squared, which is cool because now we have a sine only equation. Beautiful. Wow. Amazing. Nice, right? But uh, let's go ahead and put everything on the same side. Maybe the right hand side would be better sine squared plus sine minus one. Notice we're gonna bringing the, we're gonna be bringing the one uh, with the minus sign, and we do get a quadratic equation. How nice, right? Well, quadratic equations can be solved because we have what's called a quadratic formula. We have a cubic formula, we have a quartic formula. I don't think you wanna use it, but 
that are waste to solve cortex, which I talk about a lot lately. And then quintic formula, unfortunately, does not exist. Quintic equations in general are not solvable. I'm going to repeat this in almost every video so that some people understand because they say, oh, it's not solvable by blah, blah, blah. Quintic equations are not solvable in general. Okay, just accept that fact. All right, so now we get a quadratic equation. It's easy, simple. How do we solve it with the quadratic formula? You can go ahead and call this S. That's going to give you S squared plus S minus 1. I know this. you don't have to do it, but substitution is a good thing. Just keep using it. And from here, S becomes negative 1 plus minus the square root of B squared, which is 1 minus 4AC plus 4. That gives you a square root of 5. Hmm. I smell the golden ratio somehow, right? So from here, because S is sine X, sine X can be negative 1 minus root 5 over 2 or sine X can be negative 1 plus root 5 over 2, which you can also write as root 5 minus 1 over 2, which is a little better and looks more like a golden ratio. It's not the golden ratio, but I think it's close, right? Maybe it's the reciprocal or it's 1 minus the golden ratio. I mean, the golden ratio minus 1 because golden ratio is greater than 1, right? Okay, if you don't know what golden ratio is, go ahead and search it up because it's fun. Now, notice that root 5 is greater than 1. Negative root 5 is less than negative 1. Negative 1 minus a number greater than 1 is going to give you something less than negative 2. In other words, this quotient is going to be less than negative 1. You can test it out, okay? Why is that important? Because sine and cosine need to be between negative 1 and 1 inclusive. They can't be less than negative 1. They can't be greater than 1. So, Houston, we have a problem. I mean, we don't have a solution. That's what it means. So forget about it. But if you wanted to go with the complex solutions, then I would recommend, highly recommend that you use something like e to the i x minus e to the negative i x divided by 2i. Replace sine with that. Solve for this and use the natural log you're going to get complex solutions. I gave you the idea, right? Hopefully you can take it from there. But let's proceed with this. Sine x, let's write it in a nicer form. Root 5 minus 1 all over 2. Nice. What do you do with that? Arc sine both sides. Notice that this is a positive value. So it should normally give us a value of x in the first quadrant, right? When you arc sine it. So in other words, we're going to get the following. x equals arc sine root 5 minus 1 over 2, which is, by the way, approximately 38.17 degrees. I want to write in degrees because in radians, this would be crazy. You don't want that. So I'm going to use degrees for now. Allow me to do it. And then uh, this is one value of x, though. You know why? Because sine is positive in the first and second quadrant. If you have two supplementary angles, their sines are equal. You see that? First and second quadrants. So to find the other solution, by the way, I'm just kind of trying to stay between 0 and 2 pi or 0 and 360. You've got to have to subtract this from 180, not 2 pi, because you are in degrees. You're not in degrees, but the angles are in degrees. Make sense? And this is approximately 141.83 degrees. Now, <coughs> we must go with the second quadrant. Because cosine x is less than 0. Not even equal to. Can't be. Cosine x is less than 0. So we have to go with the second value, which is about 141.83 degrees. Let's go ahead and check our results against Wolfram Alpha, or I mean Desmos. That's what I meant. And Desmos, tada, is showing us a solution, which is, uh-oh, 2 point something. Hmm, that's weird, right? Weren't you expecting something like 141.83 degrees? Well, this is in radians. Guess what? Radians is obviously... Because if you do this in degrees, it's going to look crazy. So you always want to use radians, derivatives, integrals. Everything works with radians. Degrees we only temporarily use so that, you know, normal people can understand it. Now, how do you convert it? You got to think about it. One... 180 degrees is pi, which is about 3.14. So divide 180 by 3.14, you're going to get 1 radians in degrees, 60 something. 
This is more than two times that, so two point something in radians is gonna be our answer. Of course, there's more answers if you go to the left or to the right, but this is the smallest positive angle that we can find. And this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time in another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.